Please be seated. Well, good morning, everyone, on this dreary morning, <laughs> the day after, so to speak. This morning, I'm, I'd like to talk to you about Hebrews 10. Just go through Hebrews 10 and kind of pick it apart a little bit and see what it says about the superiority of Jesus. So if you would open your pew Bibles to Hebrews 10, we're going to look at verses 1 through 14. And before we begin, just a couple words about Hebrews. Um, originally, the, uh, the, the church, the church fathers, attributed the book of Hebrews to the Apostle Paul. Later on, scholars... I don't know, probably in the last 100 or 200 years, decided that Paul didn't write it. And so now we call it the author of Hebrews. Um, I kind of figure that since the early church might have known what they were actually doing and been a lot closer to Paul than we are, I have a tendency to attribute it more to Paul. Although when we look at it, you can see there's a difference in the, uh, the style of the book of Hebrews than there is from his other epistles. It may have been somebody who was uh, from his school that, that wrote it, or it could have been something that he did an outline. We don't know. We don't know. But I tend to lean towards Paul's authority, Paul's authorship, since the early church fathers believed that. They were a lot closer to him than we are. So beginning with verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. And to back up just a step here, one of the purposes of Paul in writing the book of Hebrews was to show the superiority of Jesus in all things. He starts off by talking about angels and showing that Christ is superior to to the angels, that he is greater than the angels, which I don't know how the Jehovah's Witnesses deal with that because they say that Jesus was the Archangel Michael or is the Archangel Michael. I don't know how they deal with the book of Hebrews. They must change it or don't read it or, yeah, something like that. Um, but anyway, verse 1 here. The same sacrifices are offered continually every year, making perfect those who draw near. In Hebrews 8.5, we read, They the priests serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. Now let's talk about shadow here. Shadow seems to be an important word for Paul. A shadow has no substance, if you think about it. It's an outline or a lack of light caused by another light source, which is Kind of a neat analogy if you think about the building of the tabernacle and building of the temple and um, the, the law being a shadow of the true uh, presence of Christ, of the true law, of the true tabernacle in heaven. How, can you, how could you describe something being less than that but by using the word shadow? I think it's a perfect word. Paul is saying that the law and the tabernacle are simply an outline of the real tabernacle in heaven and an outline of the way of salvation, an outline of the way of forgiveness of sins. Salvation cannot be attained through obeying the law. Why? Because we can't keep the law. If we've broken one part of the law, we become lawbreakers. James tells us that, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. So, if you rob one bank, you're a lawbreaker. If you speed, you're a lawbreaker. It's, it's all the same. So Paul's saying, since the sacrificial system is only a shadow of the true sacrifice, being Jesus Christ, it needs to be repeated over and over again because it is not complete. Verse 2. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. Since these are repeated over and over again, they're not really removing the sin. They're only covering it to be dealt with later. 
Otherwise, if it was actually removing sin, it wouldn't have to be repeated. Verse 3, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. That's an interesting verse. Paul is saying that the sacrifices were to be a reminder of the people's sin and their continual need for cleansing. It's a reminder of the sin that plagues, plagued Christians, that plagued mankind. Again, I'm not saying that we don't sin. We do sin. But now that we've received Christ, we no longer have a sin nature. We no longer have to sin. And as Bill Johnson says, it's no fun anymore. Sin is no longer any fun. And really, it isn't. Verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of goats and bulls to take away sins. Now, this is where Leviticus comes in. Leviticus 17.11, um, the Lord says, The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. This word atonement is an important one. And it literally means to cover. To figuredly, to expiate or condone, to placate or cancel. So these sacrifices had to be repeated continually to cover Israel's sin. But they never removed them. It had to be done time and time and time again. Now I should have a slide there, Marie. Could you pull up my slide? I see what you're doing, the verses, and that's wonderful. Thank you. One with a lot of numbers on it. Oh, let me try. There we go. It's small. I hope you can read it. I found this really interesting website last week that shows how many sacrifices would have been necessary to cover my sins since the time I was born until today. Get a load of this. There'd be two lambs daily. That's 43,518 lambs. Weekly, two lambs every seventh day. That'd be 2,318 lambs. Monthly, two bulls, one ram, seven lambs, one goat, 1,474 bulls, 737 rams, and I think that's 5,150 lambs and 737 goats. Just for me. Just for me. That's a lot. Now, one thing to remember is this is corporate, okay? So it's not that many for every person. It's that many for the nation of Israel, and I would have fallen under that. And I have many years left. That's a lot of blood, isn't it? It's a tremendous amount of blood. And that's not counting the festivals. I'm sorry, Paul. Just to cover my sins, not to take them away. And that's not counting the blood shed at festivals. You see, the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, sin was only covered. Y'all remember chamber pots? <laughs> no? We had one, but we, we, we got rid of it a few years ago. It was decorative. But as I was, pr as I was praying about this, the Lord showed me a a uh, vision of a chamber pot. And he was saying that, you know, the atonement was like covering the chamber pot. But what was in the chamber pot was still in there. And when you took the cover off, it stunk just as much as it did before. But when Jesus came, he took it all away. He removes the sin. He doesn't just cover it. It's now gone. Jesus removed the sin by becoming our sin. The Bible says, Paul says, that he became sin for us. He didn't just take them on himself, but he became sin. That thing which he despised, which he hated. Verse 5 and 6. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. This quote is from the Septuagint, 
which is a Jewish translation of the Old, or excuse me, it is a Greek translation of the Old Testament done, I believe, about 300 years before the time of Christ. That's the translation that most of the New Testament writers did when they uh, quoted the Old Testament. So Paul's saying here that Jesus assumed a body that's called the Incarnation, what we're celebrating now in Advent. He assumed a body to become like us so that he could become our sins. He became human so he could become human sin. Only a human could become human sin. Does that make sense? God couldn't send an angel to do it. He couldn't use an animal to do it to take on human sin. Only a human could take on and become human sin. And then the question is, why does God take no pleasure in burnt offerings and sin offerings? I think it's because they really were not restorative. They didn't really restore us to him. They were a step, but they didn't really restore us to him. The sacrifices were incomplete. Only Jesus provided a perfect, complete sacrifice by his perfect blood, therefore being pleasing to the Father. And verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. It was the will of God, the will of the Father, that Jesus become the sacrifice, the superior perfect sacrifice to remove our sins. It was God's will from the beginning of time that this should be. And one thing we need to remember is the purpose of the law is to reveal the severity of sin. It's to show us that we can't do everything that, that God wants us to do perfectly in order to, be, in order to be righteous before him. We cannot obey those 613 laws. If we break one of them, we're a lawbreaker. Law could only cover the sin. Adam and Eve in the garden. They're, they're tempted by the snake, by the serpent, by Satan, and they fall. God comes, has a little chat with them. Must have been a very difficult chat. And then finally he kills two animals and he makes skins to cover them. That was the first sacrifice for sins. God kills two animals to cover their sins and he also gives them skin to cover their nakedness. Before that, they didn't know they were naked. I think there's a, there's a spiritual truth there that, that by covering their bodies that he's also covering their sins. The, the spiritual and the physical are, are somehow meshed together there. It's important for us to remember that God desires more than covering our sins, but to take them away, as he did in Jesus. Verses 8 and 9. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. Paul's saying here that the Old Testament system of sacrifice has been now usurped by a superior sacrifice. It doesn't mean that it's been negated. It's only that God takes it and builds something new and better on it, which is what he continually does as he reveals himself. In Hebrews 8.6, we read that Christ instituted a superior covenant, a covenant that is superior to the one that God instituted with the Jewish people through Abraham. We're all familiar with that. So God is telling the, the Israelites that he desires more than just offerings and sacrifices. If you think about it, those were things that we do. God wants a change of heart. He wants obedience because of that change of heart. He wants an inward change more than reliance on works and tradition. We can do everything perfect in our church service and still miss it. People can do everything perfect in the church service at the right time, do the right thing, all the genuflecting and all that stuff, and still 
not go to heaven. Because it's not what we do, it's what he did. That's important. Jesus' obedience to the Father was one of the reasons that his sacrifice was superior. He did what was pleasing to the Father. He fulfilled all the 613 rules of the law perfectly, never sinning. That's another reason his sacrifice was perfect and superior. Verse 10, And by the will, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus, the perfect offering, has made us holy, righteous to stand before God. He has done what all the Old Testament sacrifices could not do. Because of what Jesus did, every Christian has been separated from their sins. They've been taken away. Not just covered, but taken away. And this includes sin that we have yet to commit. Now, I'm not saying that we should not ask forgiveness of sins. We should not repent. We should do that. But what I'm saying is in God's eyes, they haven't happened. They never happened. When we received Christ, everything we had done up to then, all that sin was forgotten. And Jesus looks at us through the lens of Je- or excuse me, God looks at us through the lens of Jesus Christ. He sees us perfect. Wow. He sees us perfect because of what Jesus did on the cross. He doesn't see all the stuff that I've done in my life and the stuff that I have yet to do. He doesn't see all that sin. He only sees Jesus' perfect work. That is amazingly good news. Amazing. Verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. Paul contrasts the Levitical priesthood with Jesus, our priest. Remember, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And that's not just in the New Testament. The Old Testament says that also. That is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Jesus is contrasting what the Levitical priest did over and over and over again, as you saw with that graph, just for me, with Jesus' perfect sacrifice once. Once. And it's all done. It's all taken care of. Verses 12 and 13. We're hitting the home stretch here. When God had offended for all time, offered, excuse me, when, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. The Levitical priests always stood before God. There were no seats in the sanctuary because their work was never done. They were always doing something, always offering sacrifice. There were always more sins to cover. In contrast, Jesus sat down after offering his perfect sacrifice. He sat down because his work was done. It is finished. It is finished. Verse 14, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's really a remarkable verse. For a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Who's being sanctified? You and me. You and me. He's perfected us. By his work, he's perfected us for all time. The law, the Old Testament sacrifices could not offer perfection or they wouldn't have to be repeated time and time again. And that's the beauty, the awesomeness, I don't don't know the word, the, the incredibility of what Jesus did is it's, he's already done it all. And we're perfected in God's eyes. When he looks at you, he sees perfection. That's remarkable. In today's gospel, we read about Jesus in the Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we read, In being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. 
Jesus was in agony at the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, look and see what's happening around. He hasn't been, he hasn't had any physical attacks yet. He simply has gone to the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples are there. He goes to pray. But he's in agony already. Why? I think that it was because the sins of the world had been placed on him at that time. I think that's when he was feeling, shall we say, the pain, the pressure, whatever you want to say, of the sins of the world. I can't, can't prove that scripturally, but that's my feeling. That's why he was in agony. He was placed under spiritual torture, if you will, when all the sins of the world, all the wrath of God was placed upon him. Suddenly, God the Father, who he'd had such an incredible, intimate relationship with, withdrew himself. And he was alone for the first time in his life. I have often wondered how people in the world make it without Jesus. I really do. How do, how do they cope with someone's death if they don't know that, that they're going to see them in heaven, if they don't know that they're going to heaven. Can you just you go through life taking your best shot? It's so sad. It's so sad. That separation that, that they must have every day, that emptiness, that loneliness that you and I don't have, I'm not saying we don't have problems, we don't have issues, we do. But they have absolutely nothing but people, the world, to rely on, to count on. And when they close their eyes for the last time, that will be lost too. Jesus' sacrifice, what he did on the cross, was for you and I. I'm sure you've all heard the old phrase that when, when Jesus was on the cross, he was thinking of you. He was. Paul says that, that for the joy, that Jesus embraced the cross for joy. Because he knew through that act, he was bringing you and me home. He was bringing us into righteousness, into justification, into right standing with God the Father. No more thousands of animals dying to just cover sins like a chamber pot. But one perfect sacrifice for you and I. And all we need to do is just trust in Him. Awesome thing. I love the book of Hebrews. It's it's really it's it's such a neat book to read through. Because it shows the superiority of Jesus. And I love anything about Jesus, so shall we pray? Father, you are so gracious and so merciful and so loving that you sent your son to take our sins, to become our sin, so that we could live with you forever. The words to express our gratitude and, and the, what you have done, they're not, they don't exist. But we thank you, Lord, in our own humble, weak way for what you have done, for what you have accomplished through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for his perfect sacrifice, for his perfect life, for his perfect obedience. We fail you in so many ways, Lord, on a daily basis. But you are always there forgiving and restoring us and promising us, Lord, that gift of eternal life with you that when we finally close our eyes for the last time, we will open them and gaze into the eyes of Jesus Christ. There's no greater gift than that. Amen.